great. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're going to record this session. Um, but they'll only record my face. Anyway, so it's lovely to be back. And uh, we have a whole couple of hours together. So I'm hoping this can be um, interesting as well as relevant and helpful to your lives and your practice. Um, and what I thought we could do is start with half an hour or so of guided meditation. So I don't know if you haven't meditated before. Is there anyone who hasn't? Yeah. Now we're all old, old clothes. So in that case, I will offer some guidance. But if you wish to practice in the way you normally would, then please feel free. So I think that's often is only a, a suggestion, something that's for your purpose, not for mine. So um, we'll do that, and then we'll have a Dhamma discussion, uh, a Dhamma talk. Um, and the theme of today is how to enjoy solitude. And of course, how not to enjoy solitude <laughs> by doing it the wrong way and approaching it the wrong way. And uh, then at the end, we'll have maybe 40, 45 minutes for question and answers or comments and uh, challenges or whatever else. Um, you might have your own reflections to share that we can all learn from. So, so that's what we'll do. And we have about six people joining by Zoom. So they're also very much included and welcome to ask questions towards the end. Uh, so shall we start? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's. Uh, by the way, welcome. Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. I feel welcome. I feel very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we have Venerable Upeka here as well, my bikini companion, all the way from Perth, uh, joining me in Oxford for a few months, so she's also in the room. So, if you're comfortable, and sometimes you don't know that straight away, you can gently close your eyes. I'm not sure if in uh, the Tibetan tradition you sometimes keep the eyes closed, that's also fine. Um, but we just try to minimize the sense of distraction from anything pulling us from the outside world. This is our time to turn inward. Time to be with ourselves. And sometimes it's only when we have our eyes closed that we start to come in contact with the body and realize we're perhaps a little tight or stiff. Perhaps we haven't taken enough time to really get comfortable. So please feel free to adjust your posture to show your body that you care. And perhaps just noticing the atmosphere here, the company of spiritual friends. Even for those on Zoom, you can see one another, you can see me. Hopefully you can feel some of the atmosphere too. We're all here for one purpose. To learn about our mind and how to calm things down, to find that peace inside. <clears throat> And noticing all the busyness that you've now set aside. The world of sight is no more. Sounds are very gentle in the background. See if you can also notice the space between each sound. 
a place of emptiness and peace. Sense of smell and taste are not active now. But what does become very evident is the sense of touch. The sensations in your body, the feeling of sitting, sense of really arriving in this room, arriving, landing in your body. And taking the time to care. And even though we're together, hopefully with a feeling of friendship, safety, warmth, we might also notice that we're in our own little world. I imagine this is your own personal space as though you're inside a bubble. secluded from the world. Mm. And see if you can fill that space with an attitude of warmth and kindness. Friendship and respect toward your own body, toward your own mind. As though gently smiling at your inner world. as though greeting a friend.
And just noticing, allowing the mind to incline towards that which is peaceful. Noticing peace. Allowing the mind to move more and more towards peaceful states. Peace with whatever is. The mind big enough to embrace it all and be at peace. Allowing the mind to become softer, more subtle and sensitive to the feelings in the body. The peace in the heart. Just allowing everything to be. Putting things down, inclining to peace. 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 Allow the mind to 
Move more and more deeply into that. Deeper levels of peace. Letting all your worries slip away. Just inside your own body and mind. Noticing that subtle sense of peace. Perhaps noticing the peace in the breath as the breath too calms down. And just resting with the breath. If the mind slips away, that's no cause for frustration. Just make peace with the nature of the mind. It's okay. Breath is still there to return to any time.
Etam Santa Etam Panita Yaritam Sape Sankara Samato Sapu Padi Marinesago Tanakayo Vivago nudo nebana. Etam santa, etam panita. Yadidam sape sankara samato. Sabu padi patinesago Tanha kayo Virago Nirodo Nebana Quality of Nibbana is peace.
letting go of all cravings, all clinging. Stopping fighting with our minds and just remembering that in any moment we can turn to peace. Just by that slight change of attitude. Simply by noticing peace. So just taking or allowing a few more breaths into the soft, peaceful mind. Noticing that simplicity of a simple breath. And gently smiling once again, inwardly toward your body and mind. Thanking them for allowing you these few moments of peace. And noticing if you do feel that little bit more rested, relaxed and at ease. Ring the bell, then you can just gently listen to the sound of the gong. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Anyway, I relaxed a little bit there, so I hope you did too. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily mean you feel relaxed, but sometimes it can just mean being relaxed with however you feel, even if that's restless or sleepy or grumpy or whatever it is. Changing our attitude can make the difference. We don't add to the suffering of life. So today, as I said, I wanted to talk about um, solitude and how to enjoy solitude, which is perhaps uh, something that some of us naturally have an inclination toward and something that perhaps many of us struggle with or have a mixed relationship with. And... Um, I did come out of a very long retreat quite recently in uh, around about September, I would say. It was supposed to be six months. It ended up being more like four. But it was a time of deep solitude in the Australian bush uh, where I only saw mostly the kangaroos, also some lizards who used to come and literally knock on my door and then stick out their blue tongue and uh, expect some fruit or some strawberries or something from me, <laughs> which was really sweet and uh, had a magpie family as well. So I was very much immersed in nature and the animals and birds became my friend. And um, yeah, I was very secluded in uh, one of the most remote parts of the world and one of the most remote parts of the monastery as well. <clears throat> And uh, it was many years in the making, you know, there's a lot of preparation involved to have such an experience. And uh, I've had experiences where I've been alone on retreat for long periods, and it hasn't felt so healthy. 
and yet there are other times that it has. So this, for me, has become quite a fascinating exploration into the causes of that, you know, why some types of solitude seem healthy and, and nourishing and other types don't. And I think, of course, it has something to do with choice. You know, when, when um, solitude uh, is enforced upon us, you know, say through the period of COVID, which has been an unprecedented experience for everybody around the globe, then that solitude can start off feeling like a treat and end up feeling more like isolation. So at that time, it doesn't necessarily feel so good. And yet most of us need times in our life alone, you know, times to rest, times to take a break from being so busy in the world. And so I wanted to talk about this today and see how we can approach the idea of solitude in a way that's helpful for us. And it came to mind, especially because I got an email recently from a Dhamma sister also in Australia. She's a Sri Lankan and she loves to go into the bush. She meets up with indigenous elders and she lives in her car, sometimes just in the middle of a kind of dried up stream miles away from anywhere. And she gets very close to nature. And recently she was offered an opportunity to be in Tasmania and look after somebody's monastery there for a couple of months on her own. And it's about 20 miles from any small town even. And she wrote saying, I really want to ask for advice on how to enjoy this solitude, you know, based on your time in, in the bush, because I'm feeling kind of restless and, you know, I'm kind of tired, even though I know I'm not really tired. And there's a kind of fuzziness instead of a clarity of mind. And I just don't really know. Do I need a schedule? Do I need more input? Do I need a teacher? Kind of what's going on? <laughs> you know, everything outside is perfect. The bush is absolutely spectacular, you know, wonderful mountains and incredible sunsets. There's so much peace outside, but I'm not feeling peaceful inside. And uh, so she asked me for some advice and I, I felt like this could be part of the reason for this talk. And also because, as I say, you know, Many of us have that mixed relationship, and yet we all need time to just reset, time in solitude to gain perspective on our lives, time to just let things quieten down in our minds, and time to just know how we tick, right? We have to learn, like, what is this thing? How do we work? You know, how do we keep screwing up our minds <laughs> and getting ourselves tied up in knots of tension? You know, how do we, how do we tick? So I wanted to start off by talking about the Buddha and how he praised, first of all, the importance of living in community and living in harmony in community. And yet how he also said that solitude was such a vital part of the path to the extent that he actually said one who um, doesn't delight in solitude basically doesn't have much chance to deepen in their practice. Uh, because you need that solitude in order to deepen your samadhi, the stillness in the mind, and as a result of that samadhi, we, we're able to have right view. We're able to align our views, our perspectives, our understanding of life with the Buddha's teachings. Um, so we're not seeing something we think we know and understand, but we're seeing things from a radically different perspective and a perspective that really frees the mind and also overcomes many of the deeper um, hindrances, the afflictive emotions like greed, aversion and um, delusion not really having a clue what's going on, right? Um, so the Buddha praised solitude and he said, one who delights in solitude is one who can practice the Dhamma. The Dhamma is not for those who are devoted and inclined to company. So how do we kind of marry this seeming paradox between the Buddha's emphasis on social and communal harmony on the one hand, but solitude on the other? And also, you know, I think, it's important to uh, realize that the two aren't necessarily opposed um, and that the solitude can deepen our contribution, the contribution that we can make to society. So it's not necessarily, he's not encouraging us to discard our responsibilities, right? So I want to explore that and also what the real kind of solitude is that the Buddha praised, you know, is it just a matter of kind of disappearing into the middle of the bush and shutting the door on the rest of our life or is solitude something even deeper than that you know I know most of you 
the vast majority of you here today are, are lay people. So you can't always close the door on your family or your husband or, you know, whoever else is in need of your time. And the same for me as like an abbot in my new role. Um, there's so many things to be doing all the time, you know, emails coming from every direction. So, you know, how can I actually uh, develop solitude in that atmosphere as well? So I did want to talk about retreat mostly, but we'll talk about that too. And of course, if there's anything I miss, we can bring it up in the Q&A. But uh, one of the things I've realized with uh, solitude and healthy solitude is that preparation and a proper context is the key to really being able to get the most out of time alone. And also, as I say, that right view, the right perspective on why we um, why we should aim for having some solitude in our life, like why it's important to have that quiet time, whether it's just a moment in the day, you know, or like 20 minutes here together, or whether it's a week's retreat or a month. You know, there's one uh, of Bikuni who many of you may know, Jetson uh, Henzin Palmo. She's an English um, nun who ordained many, many years ago. I think she's more senior than my own teacher now. So it's, I don't know. It must, she must be about 55 years in the robes. And she lived in a cave for like 12 years at about 3,100 meters altitude, um, even to the point where she got snowed in at one point and almost lost her life. But she just tunneled her way out, you know. So anyway, we're probably not going to be doing that. <laughs> but, you know, is that advisable? even for any of us and even though I've been practicing 27 years now I know that I'm not ready for that just from my own experience in in solitude till now so it's really that um wise perspective you know what is good for me what is healthy for me and also the right approach the right attitude towards solitude towards retreat and learning to have a healthy attitude to our body and mind so this is just an introduction but I want to look into this a bit more deeply uh, because the Buddha talked about two types of uh, seclusion, which he called viveka in the Pali language. He said there's kaya viveka, which is like the bodily solitude. So that might mean taking ourselves away temporarily. So maybe you have a meditation space in your home, you can like close the door or a cupboard, even a cupboard, you can close yourself in. I've got cupboards for naughty guests in the new monastery. <laughs> They're really nice. They fit at least three. So I can have up to three so that I know there's cupboard space <laughs> should we need it. I'm just kidding. But most meditators enjoy a cupboard. <laughs> uh, so, you know, however long that solitude is, um, we need to have a suitable place. So I think one of the keys is avoiding too much too soon. And, uh, you know, unless you're a hermit in ancient China, or even today, I think, in modern China, there are these incredible kind of limestone casts. I don't know what they're actually ge geologically called, but these incredible mountains in China that you can just walk up and find all these caves. And there are hermits living there today who actually don't depend on others. They kind of grow very simple food and they basically live in the, in the mountains. Nobody really knows where or who they are. The same in Burma, there are people, obviously there's a big uh, monastic sangha, but there are also these people called Vezato, Wizato, which sounds like wizard, and they look a bit like wizards. They've got these funny hats and sort of long bit here and this funny pointy hat, and they live kind of as hermits. I remember saying to my mom once many years ago, maybe I should be a hermit, and she said, now that is going too far. <laughs> It's like, haven't you done enough already? <laughs> she said, she really put her foot down. But the thing is, I've met some of these people and they do look a little bit wild, you know. And when you read the suttas, you realize that the Buddha actually formed the Sangha, the monastic Sangha, for a purpose, to be mutually dependent on the lay community. And that was in order to keep us on track, you know, so that the lay community can kind of act as... Um, uh, people who we're accountable to and people who can kind of let us know if we're going a little bit off course. And of course, it's it's the other way around as well. So as monastics, we're to provide spiritual counsel. Um, but by having to receive our food from the lay community, we have to have that interaction, that engagement. So the Buddha actually made it not so easy to have complete solitude in terms of really closing our door. Yeah, And that was for good reason. 
So, um, yeah, if you are at home, obviously, you keep your external business to a minimum if you can. And if you're in retreat as well, you can tell people, you know, I'm on retreat now. Please don't contact me unless there's an emergency. And I was very lucky in Australia that Ajahn Brown, my teacher, would even check my emails for me when there was something really urgent. Obviously, not all the time, but I needed some medicine at one point. And he um, had access to my account. He can have access to anything he wants. He's got access to my whole life. So <laughs> so there's nothing I can't share with a teacher that I trust. And he looked after that for me, you know. So in the same way, you know, at home, if you need to take time for yourself to inform people, to ask for their support and to know that they're there for you, you know, so you can feel safe. <clears throat> So as I say, you know, this experience in Perth recently or in the in the forest was decades in the making, you know, and I started off by doing 10-day um, retreats with my first teacher, SM Goenka, where we would sit a lot in a group, like all day, basically, for 12 hours a day. And it was a lot of inner solitude, but the body was still among others. And that gave a feeling of enormous safety and holding. And we also had instructions, you know, and check-ins with the teacher throughout the day. And so I would do this and get very established in the practice, know my know the technique. You know, in the early days, technique was very important for me because I needed to have something to do with this restless mind. And over time, you know, I would extend the length of retreat that I would take as I got more confident to be uh, independent in the practice. <clears throat> and then I ordained in Burma in 2004 first of all and then again in 2006 and I used to practice equally intensively there but much more in my own kuti much more in my own space but still having that teacher present you know and so by the time it came to the six month retreat in in the bush um, I had a very well established relationship with the whole community I was ready to be in an isolated cabin, basically a kuti. We call them kutis, a little uh, hut, which was, I basically had about 150 acres to myself. It was magical. It was idyllic, you know, absolutely spectacular. Almost too beautiful to be true. And sometimes too beautiful to keep the solitude <laughs> in terms of, you know, eyes downcast. I'd be like, oh, oh a kangaroo, <laughs> a magpie, whatever. Um, so I had this experience there, but I also had this amazing support system of people who knew and trusted me, who would prepare the food that was suitable. And I had a teacher there who I checked in with once a week. So, you know, if I was going a little bit kind of you know, restless or anxious, he'd be able to just kind of, just by his sheer presence, really calm me down. But sometimes we need another person with a well-regulated nervous system to calm down our own nervous system when it gets a little bit fraught. And of course, also to give that encouragement, you know, if I wasn't sure I was going deep enough, fast enough, we'd say, you're really doing well, you know, you much more peaceful, much more blissful than usual. Uh, I can see the difference. So that was very, very good for me and someone who can know my mind and who I trust. And uh, again, you know, in the suttas, uh, the Buddha talks about uh, meditating also with good companions in the spiritual life. And so I had my good companions there, many people that I know. Um, I didn't speak with anybody. But uh, there's a lovely story in the suttas where uh, the Buddha goes to meet three monks who he knows very well. I think one of them or two of them are actually his cousins. Venerable Anna Ruda and Nandia and Kimbala, they all live together. And he used to ask them how they're doing, how they're doing in their practice. And they'd say, well, the way we establish mindfulness, not by watching the breath or by sweeping the body, but it was by doing little favors for each other. So, for example, they'd go on the arms round in the morning, you know, again, they'd meet people, but they'd stay in silence. And then whoever got back to the monastery first would sweep and put out the the bowls, you know, for washing their feet or whatever. They make the place ready for the food and uh, they'd eat and then they'd leave whatever was left for the other person to take when they came back from arms round and whoever finished first tied it up. So there was none of this, oh, it's your turn to do it. I did it yesterday. For goodness sake, why do I always, you know, get the leftovers? There was none of that. It was this beautiful sort of reciprocity looking out for one another. And they used to say, you know, that they would have thoughts of loving kindness 
towards one another, both in public and in private. And also bodily actions and verbal deeds of loving kindness. Yeah, so that's less likely in, in private, but you can, right? You can write somebody a card, you can make them a gift, you can, you know, you can practice these things wherever you are. And this gave this beautiful sense of being with wonderful companions in the spiritual life. And they used to sit down and meditate and the thought would come to mind, what a great gain it is for me. What an enormous gain it is that I have such incredible companions on the path. And due to this, they had so much love and kindness, so much happiness inside that their meditation quickly progressed. And uh, there were two suttas actually in the text. One's the Upakilesa Sutta, where they were practicing this way, but they were still having some trouble calming the mind. And then later on, there's another sutta. I think it's the Chula Gosinga Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. Uh, I looked it up the other day. I think it's 31 or something like that. And in there, the Buddha goes back and they're still practicing that way, but now they've become fully liberated. And it's just amazing. And this happened during a rains retreat. This happened during three months due to the solitude because they didn't actually speak together other than about the Dhamma, but also due to this harmony that they'd established together. And I think this is so beautiful and such a big clue as to how to have that healthy solitude so that the harmony that we establish in community is not just for the sake of chit chat and socialization but it can act as a kind of springboard from which you can plunge into solitude knowing that you're held knowing that your companions are there looking out for you you know and you can turn to them at any time also for the dhamma to talk about the dhamma so this is one thing that's very nice to establish in the beginning if you're fortunate enough to be in that situation <laughs> So that's for the uh, bodily seclusion. But then how about the mind? How do we actually get to that point where we can be so at peace within that our minds can be secluded from the outside world? They can be secluded from the five hindrances, from the disturbances in the mind, like greed and uh, restlessness or sleepiness or doubt, aversion, all that negativity that can come up towards ourself when we're alone or towards other people with whom we haven't made peace. So one other really good tip is not to enter a retreat if you have unfinished business with other people. I've made the mistake of doing that before where there was some kind of misunderstanding and then it would weigh on my mind. I should have clarified. I should have, you know, talked about it. And of course, in the meantime, a lot of gossip can happen and a lot of, yeah, speculation. We can misunderstand one another. So if possible, we can try and clear up those things first of all. And then you might be surprised to know that um, my teacher tells me as soon as I go into retreat, and he repeats it actually throughout the retreat, he'll say, well, how are you eating? You know, are you getting enough food? And I'm thinking, oh, isn't he going to ask me about my meditation? But no, he asks first of all, like, are you sleeping enough? Are you getting enough food? Because these two things are fundamental. And you'll often notice when you go into solitude, even for a moment, even if you come here to meditate, that the first thing you realize is how tired you are, you know, how tired these minds are that we're just pushed around and kind of beaten up every day of our lives, really, you know, until we finally stop. And then we expect that our mind is just going to say, great, you know, now I'm going to be peaceful. I'm going to do exactly what you want. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so the priority is a first sleep, eat, and then meditate. And this is really important. So especially if you're in a long retreat, you know, it's, it's, uh, you can really give your body and mind time to just recuperate and be patient in letting the energies arise, letting them realize. So for this person who wrote to me, uh, she was saying about this fogginess and being sleepy, but not actually tired. Some of it is just the brain being exhausted. And after a while, if we let that be, if we just don't fight it, then it does start to lift. It's like a mist that's got in there and it's kind of settled really deep inside. And after a while, it just starts to clear. But if you try and push it away, you're using more energy. So it never gets, you know, you never, you're just fighting a wall. So the first thing is to really allow yourself, allow all those tensions that we store in the body, that we store in the mind to just unwind in their time. And this is why it's so wonderful when we do have enough time. Even if you only have like a week's retreat, you can spend half the week sleeping. I just did that recently. I had two weeks, but uh, I spent four days 
sleeping about eight or nine hours a night and two two hours in the afternoon. And I don't know if anybody else here has had this, but I'm sleeping in the afternoon a bit and I'm trying to get up. My eyes are like this and I'm like dreaming that my eyes are kind of stuck, <laughs> kind of trying to pull them open. And uh, it's a very strange feeling, but I recognize, yeah, my body is just tired. So just let's see how long I can stay here until I really am so bored that I want to get up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because after a while, you will get bored with lying down. But in the beginning, that's okay. And then the Buddha said, you know, well, I don't know if the Buddha said, but I think the first thing to do on retreat is to have a very clear sense of a goal. And that may ring alarm bells because we shouldn't really be having goals. But what I like was the advice Ajahn Brown, my teacher, gave to me several years ago, also on a three month solitary retreat. He said, make your goal contentment, make contentment your goal. And I thought that was so profound because if contentment is the goal contentment is not a feeling contentment's an attitude we have towards whatever's arising it starts as an attitude right it starts by accepting embracing really feeling this is good enough and after a while because you have that attitude even towards your sleepiness your restlessness you know your nagging thoughts you really can just say i'm content with this this is good enough I accept this completely. Come in. You know, you're welcome. If we can really say that, then we do get so relaxed that a feeling of contentment arises and we just feel at peace with anything. So it's establishing the correct goals, I would say. So rather than like aiming for a particular state of mind, we aim for something like contentment. And that means, you know, every time you notice discontent, you can remember, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I'm edging away from what's here now. I'm trying to move into the future, come back to that sense of contentment. This is really good enough for me. And at first it might seem a little bit glib, like, is it really? It's not really. I want jhanas, I want enlightenment. But after a while, you start to realize that it's such a relief to be content because contentment undermines craving. Contentment's the opposite of craving and desire. And so straight away, you're undermining one of the major causes of suffering. When we have desire, you know, we can't be content. When we have desire, there's something lacking, something missing, something we want that we don't have. So we're separated from contentment. We're separated from what is. We don't want what is. We reject it. And how can we ever see into the nature of that? We're not even willing to stay with it. So I also like to establish uh, the kind of perspective that a retreat is to understand, you know, meditation is to understand my mind. So it's not again about pushing away certain emotions that I don't think belong. It's about actually understanding what they are and how they arise. Also how they feel. Mm -hmm. One little kind of question that I have in my mind sometimes is like, what am I doing? How is it affecting me? Where is it leading me? Yeah. What am I actually doing right now with what I have? How is it affecting me? You know, if I'm clinging, if I'm averse, that's suffering, right? There's some tension there. You might not recognize it, first of all, because we've been doing it our whole life, but that's not really helping us in the path. Where is suffering leading? More suffering. And it's leading to recreating those same habit patterns. So not to berate ourselves, but just to notice and to understand what it is we're doing with our minds. And uh, another really important part of uh, establishing right perspective or what, right view, which is actually the first part of the Eightfold Path, is establishing a sense of gratitude. Yeah. So right view is not only about believing in karma, believing in you know rebirth, believing that there are people who are enlightened, but it's also um, reflecting that we depend on others you know part of preliminary right view in the in the buddhist texts is that there is mother and father i always find that a bit strange there is mother and father obviously there are teachers who are enlightened so you read this and you think why is that part of right view but over the years i've realized i think it's connected to gratitude we're not here of our own accord we can't come into the world without the help of countless people let alone our mother and father but all the people who help deliver us 
I wouldn't probably be alive if I hadn't have had the, finally, my mom got a uh, cesarean section after 48 hours because my oxygen was going down. I'd been in stock, basically. <laughs> I was quite a big baby and she was very small. Uh, so, so many people our lives are dependent upon, right? And so we're not going into solitude for ourselves and we can't take it for granted. Many, many people have been involved to make it possible. So establishing the sense of gratitude and also that there are people that have realized the path. They've realized what Nibbana really is, that sense of deep, deep, utter peace and contentment as well. And that gives the inspiration, it gives the perspective, but it also gives us a clue as to how to approach it, to establish that gratitude. And also to establish the gratitude that now I have this time to myself. There's so much suffering's dropped away. I don't have to engage so much. I don't have to travel on the busy streets to get to work or worry about the traffic. You know, I don't have to cook dinner for, I don't know, whoever depends on you. So much suffering's dropped away. And we can reflect on our good karma as well, that now whatever we've done in our lives, our intentions have brought us to this place. Today, your intentions have brought you to this place. You could have done so many other things tonight, right? But you didn't. You made the effort to come because you thought that perhaps there may be something to learn. Perhaps it may help you somehow be a better person or find a bit more peace in your heart. And, and you wanted to put your mind to those wholesome thoughts, those wholesome uh, intentions. So this is really beautiful to reflect on our own good karma, you know, our own choices. And also that whatever's arising in our mind is arising due to the past. It's due to past situations that may or may not have been under our control. Normally not. We think they are, but normally they're not. <clears throat> so this is a very helpful perspective to have throughout our meditation. That whatever's arising is a product of, path, of past causes doesn't matter what they were, but what I have is here right now. There's nothing I can do about it. So where karma is made is in how we relate to what we have in front of us now. You know, it's not about trying to change it. So if we're feeling, I don't know, resentment or jealousy, yes, maybe that's due to some unskillful uh, behaviors or ways of thinking in the past. But now, how are we relating to that? And the Buddha always spoke about right attitude right attitude if you like right relationship again towards everything that arises and the basic right relationships he said were attitudes of letting go so seeing that okay this has arisen due to causes but I don't have to own it I don't have to possess it and worry about it as you know, being something that's mine, something that's about me. It's just a phenomenon that's arisen that had its causes. And, and those causes can come to an end. So I don't have to worry about it. I can let it go. I can let it be. Sometimes before we let things go, we have to let them be. <laughs> and it's the letting be, the just allowing them into your awareness and learning to hold them with kindness that helps them unravel in their own time. So that non-clinging, that non possession if you like of your own mental states of your own physical conditions you know this body doesn't belong to you it's a product of nature and our job is to care right it's kind of been loaned to us and we can use it for really beautiful purposes for we're so lucky that we can use it to walk on this path you know or to feed the homeless people as William was telling me about in the car I was so inspired by this uh, place in Northampton the Hope Institute and the way that him and the Buddhist society here go down and support those people every week or twice a year, whatever it is. It's so inspiring to think that people choose to do that with their life and not to get sucked into all the rubbish and the negativity that you hear about in the papers, but to go out, open your eyes and look at the good that people do in this world for one another. It's just beautiful. And that is a life changer for those people. You know, that really turns them around. Even if it's only one person that manages to get, you know, their own apartment and then also give something back. This is enormous. You've changed someone's life. So we have this body to do good. And instead, we criticize it when it hurts. <laughs> so we have to establish this attitude of gratitude towards the body and this beautiful uh, way of relating that is full of benevolence, full of uh, Loving kindness, you know, the Buddha said, the way a mother loves her only child. You know, maybe you don't all have children, some of you may, 
But what about this body in a way? This body is our child, right? It throws tantrums sometimes. It runs to the loo if you had too much coffee or, you know, in my case, garlic. Um, <laughs> you know, my stomach's always getting inflamed. But, you know, it's just asking for my attention, asking for my care. And if you are in a long retreat, you really have to learn to make peace with your body and mind. You know, so the first thing that I tried to do in my long retreat was um, be a friend to my body and mind, be a friend to my thoughts, my funny habit patterns that keep on arising after 27 years, you know, because we can get really fed up sometimes when we see the same thing. But it's just products of conditioning. And if you're going to be in retreat, if you're going to be in solitude, as opposed to sorry, Trude, <laughs> bad pun. <laughs> you can feel sorry when you're alone if you don't have the right attitude. You really have to make friends with the body and mind. Yeah. You might want it to be peaceful. It might in, instead indulge in thought. But this is your body. This is your mind. You can talk to it kindly. So I actually had this funny little thing where I kind of anthropomorphized my body my mind and I think my breath and I had names for them and I'd say oh hi such and such <laughs> I won't go to as far as telling you the names <laughs> and I'd be like how are you today are you feeling okay do you want me to lean back are you okay another cushion because I have no one else to talk to I might as well talk to my body right and then I'd come to my mind okay so mind you know how do you feel today would you like to just relax or maybe do a bit of loving kindness and then after a while, I'd ask my mind, OK, do you want to see the breath? And then I'd be like, breath, hi, how are you? <laughs> and I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be verbalized, but I'm just giving you an idea of how we can actually learn to have an attitude of respect towards these things rather than seeing them as mine and identifying too closely. If we have that little bit of distance, we can put some kindness and some respect in there. And this can really help for those three things, the body, the mind and the well, the whole works, the body, the mind, the breath, the emotions, the thoughts, to start kind of working together like a team. You know, I said this to Venerable Pekka the other day. She said, yeah, not like something you boss around, right? It's like a team that are on your side. They're trying to do their best for you. So we have to give them that care. And then another part of the right attitude that's really key is um, the gentleness. It's called avihimsaka sankapa, which means literally nonviolence towards the body and mind and everything else, one another. And of course, we none of us probably think of ourselves as violent people, but how many of you would like to like open your mind and like show your thoughts, especially your tyrannical thoughts towards yourself to other people? Mm -hmm. Oh, for goodness sake, such and such. We say it like this sometimes. Oh, I still do that sometimes. I catch myself, oh, stupid. And I'm like, no, not stupid. <laughs> So, you know, we have that violence towards our minds and it's not the path. The Buddha said we have to develop this attitude of gentleness with our body and mind. And the deeper we go in the practice, you know, the subtler our experiences become, the more gentle the mind that's watching needs to be. You know, the, the less of a hand that interferes there needs to be. It's like we have to take our hands away and just sit back and watch. Yeah, there was that beautiful simile by Ajahn Chah, the still forest pool. And he was likening this kind of attitude of being barely present or maybe not even present at all to sitting in the forest in the jungles of Thailand and being near the water and, the, you know, the sun starts to set. And then all the animals start to come out of the forest and some really shy animals start to come out as well. Some really unusual animals that he's never seen before. And if he even moves a tiny little bit, even if they hear him breathe, they run away. So he has to stay so still, you know, and almost disappear so that those animals feel brave enough to stay. They don't run away. And sometimes it's like this with the states of meditation. You know, they're very supple, especially if you start to see things like lights in the mind or when the breath starts to become very soft, like cotton wool or Maybe there's a kind of emotion that's very refined, like bliss or some very peaceful state that's very ethereal in a sense. Then we have to be so subtle because if the mind watching it is too uh, coarse, 
first of all, we can't really perceive those things, but even if they do arise, they just slip away. Our minds are too hard to, to really stay with them. So this gentleness is really important part of the path. And when you're on a long retreat, you know, it's like you have to keep adjusting all the time because we slip back into our patterns, you know, and we start getting kind of, hmm, something should be happening now. But uh, it's always just remembering, okay, just make peace with whatever's here now. It's not about getting anywhere else. So I don't want to talk for too much longer, although I did want to say a few more things about um, the practice, just to say that uh, all the other factors of the path come into these retreats. And so another way that you can enjoy the retreat is by reflecting that the time you're in solitude most of the time you're in silence and your sealer, your virtue is almost perfect. You know, you're not using your speech in a way that harms. You're not doing any kind of wrong deeds. You're basically, you know, living a very pure life at that time. And the Buddha said, don't just be satisfied with that. Actually reflect on it. Reflect on the goodness of your life and bring up joy in the mind. And he said that that's called anavajasukha, a kind of blameless bliss. And that gives us confidence, you know, that we're good people. We haven't got anything really to be too remorseful about. And sometimes we don't notice this. We're such fault finders. We think we're not good enough. But actually, if we take time to reflect on our lives and the good things that we do, the way we do engage in charity or even just simple things like smile and be friendly to someone who looks down, um, then it brings us a lot of gladness and it acts as an encouragement and it acts to give the mind a sense of confidence, which is also important on the path. And then also, I think on a long retreat, I always advise people to, um, and in your daily practice, you know, however much time you have, to alternate, to have a bit of variety. Because the Buddha also said, as well as, say, watching the breath or I don't know what else you do. Maybe you recite mantras or do visualizations or things like that. As well as that, you know, take time to cultivate the wholesome qualities intentionally. So take time to practice things like loving kindness, because this is part of right effort, bringing up the good. You know, we're, we're supposed to abandon the unwholesome states and cultivate and increase the wholesome states. And again, sometimes we focus too much on abandoning the unwholesome and get completely sucked into our faults. But if we actually focus on like developing the wholesome, it brings us a sense of instant joy, you know, because to have a mind of loving kindness, even to just say, you know, may all beings be happy, really happy and well, and to really mean that from the heart, it does bring a sense of gladness to the mind. So we can do periods of loving kindness meditation and I always do that most well many times through the day um, and usually in a longer retreat I might start almost every meditation that way to bring a sense of gladness and ease to the mind not to look for a certain experience but just to have the right attitude and to feel at ease yeah and we can do that before we go to bed at night you know that's a time of solitude most of us are alone, at least for the last few moments before we sleep. We're not talking. Even if we have someone lying next to us, we have those moments to ourselves. And these are the kind of moments you'll have at the time of your death. You know, when you're dying, yeah, there might be people there at your bedside or whatever, but there'll be people eventually, they'll fade away from your awareness and you'll be going on that journey alone. And it's at those times that it will matter what you've cultivated in your mind. So if we have that habit of inclining to loving kindness or to compassion or even to faith, you know, confidence, say in the Buddha or in the wonderful teachers, the people that inspire you, then you'll have those qualities of confidence, of joy in your heart. And they'll come to your mind at that time when you most need them. So all these things are training, they don't happen overnight, but it's that kind of drip feeding the mind, like gradually, gradually reconditioning the mind. And, uh, and you'll find that the mind does incline the wholesome states more and more easily. Yeah. The Buddha said, whatever we frequently ponder and reflect upon becomes the inclination of our mind. So if we have thoughts of loving kindness, at that moment, it's impossible, he said, to have thoughts of ill will. So. I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? At that moment, your mind is pure. Maybe you're not completely purified, fully liberated, but at that mind, moment, you cannot have a thought of cruelty when there's a thought of compassion there. 
So to reflect in this way is also part of building the mindfulness, you know, on retreat and, and really um, enjoying some of the peace that you really deserve. You know, we, we sometimes don't really want to give ourselves those gifts of peace. We somehow think we have to be better or more advanced to deserve it. But actually it's there at any time. And then eventually, you know, when we, we really start to enter solitude within, this is what the Buddha called chitta viveka, the solitude of the mind. This is when the hindrances, the unwholesome thoughts, the unwholesome, afflictive or, yeah, I like afflictive emotions because I, I don't like the word defilement. It makes us sound like we're sinners, you know, and, and it's just such a kind of dirty word. <laughs> but the things that hurt us start to drop away, you know, the way we cause ourselves suffering starts to soften. And we start to incline towards peace. And the mind starts to be free from what we call the five hindrances. And the Buddha actually spoke about those deep states of meditation, the samadhi states of jhana, and even before, as states of seclusion, real seclusion, paviveka, sukha. And he talk, talked about it as the bliss of seclusion. So the real seclusion was the inner seclusion, when the hindrances fall away, and also even the senses start to fade you know I don't know if you've experienced in your meditation when you're really absorbed in something uh you barely hear anything outside you know when you first come here you hear the traffic you hear the clock ticking but after a while when the mind is just finding its place inside it's finding its home inside that sort of falls off your screen and you just become more and more unified within so this is a sense of oneness. It's a sense of real seclusion. You're alone, but you're alone in a beautiful place inside. You know, and, and the things of the outside world at that time can't really touch you. For people in really, really deep meditation, it's said that even, you know, fires can't harm them. Or even if you would cut somebody. And apparently someone tried this experiment in Sri Lanka. They actually, there was a person who went regularly into those deep states of meditation. And he gave permission. They tried it once without permission to cut him with a razor blade a little bit and it wouldn't go in the skin. So they were really fascinated. It was like there was a kind of force field of protection around this person. They were so secluded from the senses. It was like they didn't work in the same way anymore. But then they asked him another time before he went into that deep state if they could have permission to make that little incision. And there were some doctors there who could like, you know, make sure it was, uh, what do you call it? sterile and then to stitch it up I've got a really big one here they wouldn't do that on a big one but <laughs> yeah no <laughs> and uh and that time they could cut his skin because he gave a permission which I find so fascinating and in the Buddhist text it also talks about that you know about people who are in these deep states of meditation and the villagers thought they were dead and they'd try and light a bonfire to cremate them and they just wouldn't even burn the robe don't try it at home, okay? <laughs> because often people overestimate how good they are inside. But it's just very interesting to imagine that the mind can be, in a sense, in a sense, so unified inside that it's aloof. It's uh, secluded from the five senses. And that is a kind of bliss, a very deep bliss. You know, a bliss which is just an inner bliss that doesn't depend on anything outside. And this doesn't mean that we're not going to, it shouldn't mean that we then don't want to re-emerge and um, interact in the world. If anything, this should empower the mind with so much loving kindness and compassion and so much resilience and resource that we can serve others. And this is why it's so important to enter any kind of solitude with that right attitude. This is, I'm not just doing this for me. You know, the Buddha also said that um, the foremost community is a community where the leaders resort to solitude and they take the lead in solitude. They arouse energy to realize what they have yet to attain. And they do so for the sake of future generations who will follow their example. So this is something we can bear in mind. Yeah? And that also when we emerge from deep states of meditation, the mind has a chance to see things as they really are. So we have a chance to see Things that the Buddha told us were true, like impermanence, like suffering and not self. Yeah, we have a chance to see beyond our biased views, the things we want to see or the things we really believe are true, because the mind is so open and so receptive and soft 
It doesn't have any kind of vested interest. So it's actually ready, it's prepared to see something new. And at this time, of course, we're able to see the Dhamma, we're able to see the Four Noble Truths. I mean, obviously it can take many years and a lot of practice, but when the hindrances are absent for a long time, they're not distorting the reality anymore. It's mostly the greed, the aversion, the distort things, the delusion as well, the distorts. But when the mind is very clear, we can have a chance to see things more accurately in terms of the Dhamma. And of course, this will then strengthen that right view. So we start the process with right view, you know, just understanding that there's such a thing as karma and that the way we respond to what arises is really key. You know, that there are people who help us, provide for us, support us. And that gratitude is, is, is a good thing to develop. But then eventually, you know, we take those qualities into our meditation to the point where we're able to see even deeper into the Dhamma and overcome those hindrances in the mind so that we can really strengthen right view and become, you know, even more productive, responsible members of society, even kinder within our communities, less likely to kind of create harm. And I think really this is the point, you know, in the beginning, if you can remember to the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that uh, the Buddha actually praised certain kinds of solitude and the one that he praised the most was not even the one in deep meditation. The solitude he praised the most was the seclusion when one is secluded from immorality, yeah? So being virtuous, secluded from being unvirtuous. And one has right view, one is secluded from wrong view. So it's really the insight factor of the path, you know, that is um, strengthened enormously through deep meditation and through solitude that overcomes wrong view. And, and we're secluded from that wrong view that's going to basically cause so much suffering for us in our lives. And then he said that one finally uh, destroys all the taints. So that's, again, this greed, hate and delusion. They're destroyed and one remains secluded from them. So at first, that seclusion in our minds is temporary. You know, we might be secluded temporarily by having a thought of love and kindness from a thought of ill will. We might be secluded from the hindrances by being in deep meditation. But eventually, that seclusion has to be from the greed, hate, and delusion, and one remains secluded from them. And these are the people who are foremost in seclusion, he said, from the core. So this is the really deep seclusion. And that's not talking about taking ourselves away, right? So we take ourselves away sometimes to resource ourselves, to rest, to gain perspective, you know, keeping in mind the benefit of others, that we're doing this for others, not just for ourselves. <clears throat> but eventually, you know, we become so secluded from the really unwholesome states that we're able to really participate in the world. And if I look at the examples of my teachers and also the Buddha's life, they spent the rest of their lives after their enlightenment serving others. They were motivated simply by compassion for the good and benefit of all beings, for the welfare and happiness of all, you know, all beings who breathe, even invisible beings. So this is the real seclusion, to be secluded from those things inside that harm, that harm ourselves and that harm others. And through that, you know, we don't have to be so choosy about how, you know, where we are or even who we're with. We can maintain that beautiful equanimity and that beautiful, you know, loving kindness, compassion and sympathetic joy as well, rejoicing with the happiness in the world because inside our hearts we're free. Yeah. So this is the real seclusion that we aim for. But I would really like to encourage everybody to find delight and seclusion whenever you can. Um, you know, to bear in mind that, yeah, we are social beings, but sometimes we need to take a, just a step away and some time for ourselves. And that way, when we come back, we can engage with others much more productively, much more effectively, and there will be less chance for arguments, less chance for tensions and ill will. And we have so many methods at our disposal to practice. So I would really like to encourage everybody in that and to be really realistic. You know, there's all these tough monk stories that I hear a lot in monks monasteries mm. about people who go off into the forest for goodness knows how many years or so far away or the top of trees on a small little bit of 
this is not the point. <laughs> we don't have to be tough. We have to be sensitive to who we are, where we are on the path, and not to judge that, and to make sure you have the support systems in place. So please see if you can have good teachers, you know, good Kalyanamitas, spiritual friends, and keep coming to places like this. You know, involve yourselves as members of this Buddhist society and uh, rejoice in the goodness of your lives. So that will be for your benefit and the benefit of all those who come in contact with you on your journey. So I think that's all I have to say. Um, <laughs> it was maybe a little bit of a long talk in the end, but um haven't shared a lot about my retreat yet, I have to say. So it was nice to be able to share a little bit about my time in the bush. And I would now like to invite any questions, comments, uh, complaints, the three C's, as Ajahn Brown says. And yes, Steve, isn't it? So Steve's going to speak. I hope the people on Zoom can hear, but I'll try and repeat it if not. Yeah. Given your retreat and your implementing, um, did you notice any um, physiological changes? When you mentioned about calmness and mind and things like that. Okay. So the question was whether I noticed any physiological changes during my retreat. And there's two sides to that, because the first, at first, I did find that I had quite a lot of tensions in my shoulders and neck because I was doing a lot of internet work, uh, not secluded from the internet, unfortunately. And uh, I did find that that would slowly calm and that the knots would slowly unwind. So my body did become more relaxed. And walking meditation helped quite a lot with that. I had a really long walking path right outside the hut, joined to the hut, so that you just come out of the door and there's the path and you walk. Uh, and then, of course, the bush was there. I did some exercise every day, so that was really helpful. And just that sense of space around me allowed things to loosen up. So I did notice those kind of physiological changes. But unfortunately, I have um, a kind of stomach thing. I suppose it's an infection from living many, many years in, in Asia. And I have to be really careful because sometimes the longer I sit, the more it builds um, because things need to move through a lot. So it's not necessarily the case that sitting a lot is always good. And at one point I had a bit of a um, relapse and there was uh, maybe some water that I drank wasn't so clean. Um, and so I did actually have a really bad stomach at that time and the sitting wasn't that good for me. So I did a lot more walking meditation. And uh, my teacher took great efforts to try and find out exactly what kind of food would be good for me. Uh, because it was being left just in a little box. They'd actually made this beautiful box. It looked like a kind of bird box or something. You open the door and the food's inside at the top of a hill. So I wouldn't see anyone. I'd just go and collect my food. And it was tailor-made to my uh, stomach thing. But that brought home the importance of the four postures that the Buddha taught. You know, he said that we have to learn to meditate in the sitting posture, but also walking meditation, maybe going slow, but sometimes maybe going fast. And really listening to your body and what it needs at any time. So that's part of establishing mindfulness, sati sampajanya, you know, mindful of the bodily posture, but also mindful of what's appropriate at any given time. And then also he said uh, standing meditation can be good. So I sometimes did a bit of that. That felt good to sort of get the grounding. And actually, it was also good when anxiety arose, because I had some anxiety that came up that I hadn't really experienced to that extent before. Um, sometimes a long retreat can give all kinds of, you know, underlying emotions a chance to emerge. So I, I found that standing meditation was really good, like literally taking a stand. And then, of course, the lying down meditation, which I'm very good at. <laughs> but actually, I found that really nice. I often um, rest after lunch and I kind of practice a gentle meta body scan. So kind of really being kind to part of the body and um, yeah. and uh, allowing it to just relax so yeah yeah I think all in all it was good for the health <laughs> any other questions comments suggestions I'm yeah. just basically wondering that if if, uh, if, 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 uh, if if a person's not sort of at a certain stage of development yeah I guess well I'll include yourself that Probably if I was just presented, not to be in solitude, 
long time. Yeah. Um, I'll probably find it very hard to cope with. Right. But I just wonder that um, if, 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 if basically a person wasn't ready for that, the solitude could be actually found. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And I sort of try, I sort of touched on that a little bit, but not in detail. But um, it's interesting because I spoke to a really close Dhamma friend the other day. And he was saying that even for people who are very established in the path, sometimes it isn't that healthy to be too long in solitude. And again, that's why the Buddha actually said it's important to depend on others for the food. Mm. Um, and it's important to have teachers as well who can guide us and give us, you know, uh, an opportunity to check in. And sometimes it might be that they would advise, OK, well, come now and sit with the group. You know, you've had enough time on your own, like come and sit mm. with the group. And I actually asked my teacher this is on record now if i could do that somewhere in the middle of my retreat and he said no because <laughs> <laughs> he thought i was doing well in solitude but i knew what i needed and i said look i know what i need like i'm grown up he said no 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 you're doing really well i'm trying to protect you and i said well actually you know i think it'd be good for me i asked him several times and he said no so at that time i mean i guess i could have decided to rebel <laughs> and do it anyway but that's not my character because i felt so grateful for being there i didn't i kind of felt like yeah he's doing so much to look after me but actually it's very important to know for ourselves what mm -hmm. what we need sometimes even the teacher can get it wrong um yeah and you know for people who are alone a lot at home I mean during the whole pandemic we had three times a week we had online teachings for a community that developed over that time and this was like a lifeline for many people mm -hmm. because they had time at home and they didn't know what to do with it mm -hmm. and just checking in with the community you know and sitting together with the community was really important for them so yeah if you do have some solitude you know or you want to do your own retreat there's so much stuff now on YouTube you can actually like have a little bit of a schedule whereby maybe you listen to some guidance, some guided meditation, a dhamma talk, like a few times a day, mm. you know, and um, yeah, or maybe just start small, you know, mm. have like half a day or an hour or whatever it is. There's no judgment around it, you know. The purpose of solitude is not to say, hey, I've been in solitude for ages and ages. It's it's just to see how much is healthy and, and mm. beneficial for you. Yeah. And at certain times in my life, that might be more. Certain times it might be less. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So yeah. always be gentle yeah. with yourself. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Can you yes. We know also about set meal times. Uh huh. It's important as well to know when to eat. Otherwise, you don't eat full. Oh, right. Yeah. Into the meditation. Ah. So someone's asking about meal times and if it's important to have set meal times, otherwise you might forget to eat. That's if you're really into your meditation. <laughs> and actually, yes, it's important. One of the advices I want to give to this person who wrote to me is to eat really well. And, uh, you know, remember what my teacher said, priorities, sleep, eat, meditate, not sleep, meditate, or meditate, don't sleep or eat. Yeah. Make sure you eat well. It doesn't mean you have to eat a lot, but the food should be suitable and it should be nutritious. Um, because what can happen is that we feel like, yeah, we can't really be bothered. I've had that in Burma. The food wasn't delicious or nutritious, <laughs> I have to admit, although they gave me their very best. But uh, sometimes I was so into my meditation and I didn't feel that well and I didn't really like the food and I just didn't really eat. And I got pretty thin and pretty ill. Also because of the bacteria and things. But yeah, it, it was actually hard to learn to eat enough again. So we have to be really careful and not bypass this body, not bypass anything at all. So yeah, make sure you have meals. And if you are lucky enough, you know, to have somebody who can support that, you can have a retreat whereby someone does the cooking and just puts the meal by your door. We had something like that in our Vihara. We have like the first little Vihara, which is a little monastery in this country for fully ordained women in the Theravada tradition, in our tradition. There's only one of me in this country, Venu Bulupeka is visiting me. She's my very dear Bikuni sister from Perth. Uh, and now we have a little place. And one of the things we did recently was have a two week retreat. And it was just myself and two guests, not monastics. Um, and I'm not allowed to cook as a nun. 
but I told them exactly what is good for me and healthy for me because that's important. You know, we're not supposed to kind of harm ourselves as monastics. And people do want to help. That's the other thing. People like to be to look after one another. And sometimes we just don't dare to ask, but it gives them a chance to serve. And uh, the lay people alternated in cooking. So one would cook one day for the three and the next day, the next one would cook. And it was beautiful and it became part of their practice as well. So I've done that myself before I was fully ordained. Um, one of my friends would be on retreat for a week. I would cook, then we'd alternate. And we did that for about two months. And it was wonderful. I loved the cooking time because I could still get to meditate quite a lot. And uh, the cooking was kind of an act of giving, an act of service, something to, you know, focus my mind. Uh, yeah, must eat. Definitely. Is there anything from the Zoom room? Any Anyone would like to ask? Yes, James would like to ask anything, uh, something. I wonder if other people in this room can hear. Oh, you were unmuted. Sorry, James, if you can unmute again. Am I online? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Much appreciated. I wish I could have made it, but I tested positive for COVID just yesterday, so I thought best not to come. Um, so you, you said earlier about... Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah perfect. Ah, right. You, you said earlier today, earlier in the talk about um, no unfinished business when going on retreat. Right. Into uh -huh. well, the, prob the, the thing is, I've, I've found in life that uh, there's always unfinished business because as soon as you finish business, more business pops up to be unfinished, if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. So, could you comment on that yeah. maybe? Sure. It's impossible to finish business completely. But what I meant is don't leave, don't go into retreat when there's something that could bug you in retreat, when there's something that could kind of really play on your mind. For example, if you've just had an argument with somebody, it's not a good time to go on retreat. Mm -hmm. Try and resolve it. Try and resolve anything that is sort of outstanding. Make sure there's nothing you're running away from. You know, make sure you're not kind of, uh, um, what do you call it, um, avoiding a responsibility or a duty. You know, you were meant to go and feed the old lady next door and you just didn't do it because you were on retreat and then you feel guilty. You know, as far as possible, try and get your CELO in good shape. Try and get your virtue in good shape so that when you enter retreat, you can have a lot to rejoice in rather than to regret. So, of course, there's going to be heaps of unfinished business and we have to draw the line at some point. So. You know, at some point, the vacation responders go on and that's it. You know, you don't look at your phone, you lock it somewhere or you give it to your teacher if you have one. That's what I do. <laughs> Does that make sense? OK, yes. Uh, thank okay. you. OK. Anything else from anyone here? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's often something people wonder, but I actually think there's much more of a risk in doing the opposite of not doing that and of reflecting on all the awful things you've done, because there's a lot more sense of self usually built around the negative things. Um, the point of reflecting on one's goodness is not to build a sense of self. It's more to notice cause and effect. It's more to notice, oh, when I give something to another person, it has this effect. And that encourages the mind. And you can even like, you don't have to kind of think, I did this, I did that. You can actually just remember a time that you did something virtuous and try to tune in to how you felt. Like try to just bring up that feeling in your mind or even do it at the time, of course. But, you know, in retrospect, you can do it as well. And just bring up that feeling and just say, oh, yeah, there's something that's satisfying about that. So it's more to look at cause and effect, the effect of good deeds. Um, and to realize that, yeah, that encourages the mind. It's a good thing to do. So, yeah, I wouldn't worry about getting attached to it because anyway, as long as we're not um, stream winners, then we have attachment to self. We have a sense of self. It's better to have a 
positive one and a wholesome one and one that kind of rejoices in the goodness in your life than to have one that berates oneself. Yeah. So the Buddha did recommend it. So yeah. Yeah. It's good if you can try. Otherwise, the meta meditation is also a way of generating a lot of wholesome qualities, you know, wishing yourself well. And if that's difficult, wishing someone you really do care for that you have a very kind of simple and um, wholesome relationship with just wishing them well. Uh, or even bringing up to mind people that are happy. And uh, yeah, bringing their happiness to mind and reflecting on it and feeling good for them, feeling happy for them. That's also a wholesome state in you. So there's lots of ways to tap into happiness. Mm. It really is. It really is. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, people say that about deep meditation as well as a danger of attachment. The point is that you're actually letting go of quite a lot in order to cultivate wholesome states. You're letting go of the negative things. You know, part of right effort is to, um, the Buddha said, it's to uh, abandon the unwholesome states and to restrain them from coming in, but then to notice the wholesome states and to increase them. So, yeah, we're actually being advised to do that by the Buddha. So, yeah, don't worry about attachment to that. It's okay. It's more wholesome than attachment to chocolate cake or TV or, you know, we, we often don't worry about those ones and we worry about the, the really wholesome ones. <laughs> so it's kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, experiment, find out for yourself as well. Mm. Can I add to that? Yeah. I also wonder sometimes, I feel it's how you hold it as well, like um, with the sense of... Uh, Speak up a bit. Oh, it's also how you hold that, no, I did something good. Um, but um, that's a universal quality of goodness mm. that has, that has, that I have, I have learned. You know, not taking it personally. I don't know if that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not taking it. I am a good person. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you, you mentioned the anxiety. Uh, and I wondered, uh, Steve asked about the physical yeah. manifestations. And I'm not crying. Yeah. Oh, no, you can. <laughs> I don't have to answer. <laughs> and, yeah. But did the anxiety arise from bodily stress or was it as a result of thoughts? Was it, you know, worrying about something? Or? Yeah. That's an interesting question. I've had two different types. I've probably had many different types. During that time, there was actually something that hadn't been resolved and that was a problem that was happening behind the scenes that I was kind of getting a sense of. And the more I was getting a sense of it, the more the anxiety was starting to arise. So there was actually an external trigger for that in a way. But then I've also had anxiety arise in solitude just from being alone too much mm. because that was actually a very healthy situation of solitude and I think it was fine that it arose because there was a need to be anxious about the situation and it led to a resolution so it was actually okay um, and I'm kind of I do feel much stronger I have to say for having processed it even though I went through actual anxiety attacks which I've never experienced honestly since that situation was resolved I feel so much stronger and I feel much less um uh kind of ashamed about those emotions like I feel I don't know I feel really strengthened it's like everything falls apart and afterwards you're okay but you're more authentic as well mm -hmm. I feel kind of it was a really good thing to go through but there had been another one the pre the previous year actually and that was when I had three months of solitude at the end of a year and a half of isolation due to covid and it was just too much. That's why I said, I think there's something like solitude and something like isolation. And at that time it was just too much being alone because I was literally alone for like two years or something. 
hardly saw anybody. Maybe like once a month I'd have a walk with somebody towards the end of COVID. Yes. And that was weird. That was kind of like the nervous system being a bit dysregulated and needing the presence of somebody. I really felt like I need the presence of somebody. Mm. Um, and I spoke to this same spiritual friend the other day and they said, oh, it's cabin fever. Like it's well documented. This idea of cabin fever when you're just alone for a long, long time because we're social beings mm. and we need to be in relationship to some extent with others. So I think that's why the Buddha established a Sangha, so that you can have a whole community of people mm. who are alone, but they're alone together. Mm. And they come together at certain times and they have common values that they recite together and that they reinforce together. And then they have their like, yeah, I'm ready to go back now to my solitude. So, yeah, I've had different types of anxiety, actually, in the last few years. Mm. Um, and it's a really interesting one because the feeling of anxiety is that there's something really dangerous going to happen. Mm. But actually, when you realize, no, that's not the case, it's just a feeling and you can really open up to it. It can make you very um, sensitive mm -hmm. and easy to connect with other people. So I started talking about that to people, which is why I said you can cry, because I think it's really good to talk openly about mm -hmm. these things, because then loads of people come to me and say, I also have anxiety. It's so nice to hear that you talk about it too. And uh, these are, again, like the wholesome states, they're universal experiences that we all have from time to time. So, yeah, but I think it's important to feel there's enough holding there. Mm -hmm. There's enough, uh, yeah. I, I, I've been trying to understand it. I mean, your mother didn't want you to be a hermit. <laughs> but this trip which you're speaking about in Australia, it wasn't a hermit, did you? No. There were, there were people clearly coming. Yeah. Around. And I'm not a hermit because it's kind of, I think she understands that it's part of monastic life, that sometimes I'll be engaged and sometimes I'll yes. be alone. So she understands it's finite. I mean, it was a long time and I guess, you know, it might have been edgy. I'm not sure. She didn't say it was difficult for her, but she had my teacher's number and she phoned him up a few times. Okay. So I put some systems in place. So she actually did phone him up and ask, is she okay? And then I would tell me, nice. your okay. mum's phoned and asked, are you okay? I'm so I was not really concerned about your mum's worries about it. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, but the hermit but thing. It wasn't that, you weren't isolated. No, not completely. No. 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 Because, um, um, Trudeau, but yeah. that's um, a master, was once asked, why do people spare space? Right. And I'm guessing you didn't really have an experience that you weren't, Ooh. that you were cut off away, or did you? I was very secluded. I had a right. feeling of very deep seclusion. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't see anybody except my teacher once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot of seclusion, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think maybe connected to what you're asking is the importance of um, of having a teacher, actually. Mm. Um, because the Buddha did say that spiritual friendship's the whole of the holy life. Yes. And I think, you know, solitude just on its own without proper guidance mm. can go in any direction because unless we really have our feet mm. on the path I mean we're going to go off on all kinds of side roads there are so many different experiences you can have on your mind and you know things that you might take as enlightenment experiences that might be nothing like enlightenment um, and you need a teacher to be able to differentiate that so I think that is the important thing and um even people like Jet Sumner, Tenzin Palmo, she yeah. had 12 years of solitude, but she still had people coming once yeah. a month to give her food. But And she also had 12 years of preparation mm -hmm. where she lived in monasteries and she had a teacher. Mm -hmm. And as far as I understand, she actually, from that book, Cave in the Snow, as far as I remember it, she already established very deep states of samadhi mm -hmm. before she went into the cave. Yeah. So she had that inner yeah. resource. Because so. I'm, I'm guessing that it, so there was a ground for it. Yeah. They were grounded in the sense that there was, you know, there was isolation, there was still yeah. contact. Yeah. And you were on the internet, for instance. Uh, oh, no, I didn't have internet. Oh, you didn't have no. internet? <laughs> no. My teacher had my internet. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, ultimately, we will have that ground just when we die. That's we'll, it. We'll be alone. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have to learn to be with our minds mm -hmm. and to make peace with our minds. So how do we, in your tradition, let's say, well, they all stem back to Buddha, but how does one relax into uh, these ideas? I mean, one has 
Do people hear the questions? Yeah. How does one relax into anxiety and apprehension? Fantastic question. So the way I do it, I guess, one of the ways is, um, as I say, love and kindness is a big part of my practice anyway. So I do that regularly. And I think generally that helps me have a wholesome attitude when it arises. Mm -hmm. Not always. So if I notice that my mind is like getting small and it's getting into the anxiety and feeling like too identified, as in the whole being is anxious, mm -hmm. then I open up my awareness. I just mm -hmm. physically open it up or yes. mentally open it up, I suppose you could say. But I mean to incorporate more of the body because we have negativity bias. We have that thing, you know, the psychologists call it negativity bias. Wherever there's a pain, the attention goes there. Wherever there's anxiety, room, you're in there. So open it up and feel other parts of the body. Mm. One really nice method I learned from my first teacher, um, Goenkaji, is to feel the palms of the hands and the sole of the feet, even the top of the head, and the places that basically don't really feel strong emotions because they're usually quite neutral and even quite pleasant. So you can sit and you can, without running away from the anxiety, you can just keep your awareness mostly there. And then you're kind of with it, but you're also with something else as well that gives it a wider container. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you rest your mind somewhere that it's easier to rest it, mm -hmm. but part of the mind is also aware of the anxiety. There are different ways. I mean, you can also, if it's really strong, say if you're having a panic attack, you can change your breathing. Mm -hmm. You can do a kind of um, breath work, which is pretty much based on the yoga tradition, yeah. actually, where you breathe in for say six and then you breathe out for exactly the same amount it's like really regulated mm -hmm. and then there's another one where you breathe in for like four or five hold it for six mm -hmm. breathe out about eight and that's like more strong like really breathing out and that relaxes the nervous yeah. system so that can be a way i, I asked because in fact william sorry it's good that's a straight point you have to be one of the ones asking so a lot of our teachings and readings and so forth are about relaxing it too yeah they such as anxiety, and uh, uh, this has been something of uh, William's uh, um, questioning about you know how he actually relaxes with yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. The other thing is noticing a tendency to want to get rid of it because mm. we usually mm. have that. So noticing the tendency to not want it, and then realizing that's not right, right attitude, mm. and just seeing if you can soften that mm. and change the attitude and instead notice the suffering of it and actually respond with compassion. Mm. Mm. I think that's really important too. Mm. You know, I think what you said earlier, you, you talked about um, sort of having that end perspective and, and being kind to yourself. Mm. And uh, yeah. it, it might be a theological thing, but this, in this case, it, it, yeah. it's the same response you would acknowledge these these feelings yeah and, and sort of step away from it and almost say to yourself you know i'm just having this moment of anxiety yeah it's a way that my primitive brain is dealing with this situation yeah and, and yeah yeah kind of empathizing yeah empathizing exactly mm -hmm. that yeah um Recently, on my retreat in the monastery that I mentioned, the two-week retreat, I had a couple of days of restlessness. And I was like, why am I restless? I'm wanting to look at my phone and things like that. And I'm on retreat. I don't do that on retreat. And I phoned my teacher and I said, you know, why am I restless? And he said something like, yeah, just stop that. Anyway, it wasn't very helpful. It wasn't quite that bad, but it wasn't at that time super helpful. He was like, yeah, just um, just stop doing it. It wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's English actually but he lives in Australia yeah no he's wonderful I mean and you know he really is wonderful but we just have a funny relationship sometimes so yeah I mean I kind of knew what he meant and sometimes that can work but what I realized I needed at that time like I went away and thought he didn't tell me what I wanted to hear he should have told me this and this and then I realized why can't I tell me that like, why can't I tell me what I want him to tell me? Why do I have to depend on someone else to tell me what I think is suitable? Because he can't know what's right at that moment. He's on the other side of the world. So then I said to myself, well, gosh, it's really quite understandable that I'd be restless. I work so hard. I'm looking after so many things and I've been doing all these 
events organization and this and that and no wonder you're restless that's really okay it's amazing that you're not more restless gosh you know for you you must be tired and you're doing really well you're doing really well and you've got a really strong practice so I just did talk to myself in a way that I wished he had mm. you know and that was really nice because then I felt more self-dependent and not so much like <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that after 27 years of saying you've been practicing and you've been on, on retreats and whatever that you still have these moments of petulance and me and almost a sense of unfairness or fairness it still arises probably. Which one? The well, sense of, you're saying, you know, I, I, yeah, I oh, the sense of like, yes. why doesn't he tell me what I want to hear? Yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of thing. yeah sure, yeah. sure. Well, it's interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it depends as well on your mind because at the moment, I mean, I am just very overstretched and I think mm. we can look at ourselves and judge ourselves and say, oh, yeah, how come, like, you know, in the first 10 years of my practice, I was so rock solid. And now look, you know, I get anxiety. I never had that. Mm. But that's because what I'm doing is so much different and harder and more challenging. And in all those years ago, I wouldn't have had a chance of doing something like this. Mm. I wouldn't have been nearly strong. I wouldn't even open my mouth in front of people. I mean, I was totally shy. And um, sometimes we can see those things and we can think, oh dear, that's a regress, but actually, I think the more we can face and the more we can look at, it's a progress. And I think we wouldn't, you know, it takes a stronger practice to meet those things yeah. and just to be in conditions where we're always kind of in our comfort zone. So I guess it's the out of my comfort zone thing that's actually, yeah, creates challenges for me, actually. And um, sometimes I don't like that, but sometimes I can see the the potential for growth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I hope that's inspiring for people, not discouraging for people. Yeah, but sure. you know, we can be human. Like we are going to be human until we're basically enlightened, right? I mean, you're still human, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think my teacher might have anxiety ever. But you know, I, I kind of think it's good that I do because then I can relate more to others. Mm -hmm. You know, who may? Yeah. Anything else? It's pretty much nine o'clock. Shall we? Shall we have your? Maybe then I'll ask if there's one more on there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, they do, and again, I think that's why I realised at the beginning it was going to be vital to really be my own friend, because if you are alone, you only have you to be a friend. And yeah, someone can give you an interview, but it's not the same. You have to be with yourself the whole time. I think I felt really at one with the animals, with the kangaroos and the joeys. I mean, I had names for them all. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I just felt, I mean, I felt like part of the bush. I think it was the same even when I lived in the monastery in Dhammasara. Like sometimes I was lonely in terms of human company, but I felt really at one with the rocks and the bush. And yeah, I think we are actually kind of part of it. It's just that we lose that connection. And maybe that's where the loneliness comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're not actually alone ever. I mean, I was feeding the birds every day. They were my magpies. I had five and they would come every day and I had names. I knew exactly which two would come first, then the next two. Then they sit on a tree and then <laughs> and then they pretend that, you know, they try to sit there like that. I don't know they're there, but they find me wherever I am. And then if I look at them, they go, I'm not looking. I'm not looking. <laughs> they were so sweet and they'd really be patient and really polite and come only when I put the food out and they were really nice. So I had my friends. Somehow. Um, did I feel lonely? I don't remember feeling particularly lonely. I just felt that when I was going through the anxiety in particular, it would have been nice if I could have sat in the hall. <laughs> and uh, But my teacher said no. And maybe that's okay, because I did come out stronger. Sometimes, you know, we think we can't cope with something because we don't, it's not pleasant. So we think we can't cope. But coping isn't in terms of what we experience. It's not like because you have anxiety, you're not coping. It's how we deal with it that's that's the way we cope. So maybe it was good for me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I did feel lonely towards the end of the corona pandemic, that's for sure. Yeah. I'm sure many of us did, huh? I think probably we all experience loneliness in ways that we've never really had to before. But. I definitely came out of it better to cope. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 Like I need to get out into nature, do some things like yeah. that. Yeah. But now I'm more comfortable. With great. My own Yay. That's great. That's a lovely, lovely place to end. Actually, the person was just saying, for the sake of the Zoomies, that uh, that uh, after the pandemic, having faced loneliness and sometimes isolation, at least for a couple of weeks um, of complete isolation, she now feels more resilient, more able to. Uh, deal with those emotions and and more comfortable in solitude as well so yeah so it's always good to face whatever is arising as long as we have enough support so hope you all get enough support on the path to be able to uh, enjoy solitude as well as company and um, yeah learn to use whatever privilege whatever solitude whatever strength of practice you have for the benefit of all so uh, I think we should end before they throw us out of the building with great kindness I'm sure <laughs> and just uh, thank you all very much for inviting me back thank you so much for coming you, you were due to come I, I looked it was, it was going to be May 2019 or I can't yeah. remember now if we had to cancel so it's wonderful to be able to make it and having had further experiences to develop your understanding to convey that to us. So we are very pleased with it. And, uh, and it's onerous this journey, isn't it? Can you love it? And, but uh, we, we thank you and also our members who have driven you. But thank you so much. Oh.